everyone. Um, let's begin our session. Thank you guys so much for joining. And we're very happy to see you to, uh, all today. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to remind everyone that this session will later be recorded. So if you don't want to share your face um, in the recording, please feel free to turn off your cameras. And also you can change your name to be anonymous. And I'm going to read you the confidentiality and privacy uh, reminder. So uh, this session is going to be recorded by the host and the webinar session is intended for educational purpose only. This session is open to all Coursera learners, including the people who are not at this meeting today. While participation is encouraged, please be mindful that any information that you share may be accessed by an audience that we do not have complete control over. You may share your personal information at your own discretion, but please do not share identifiable information of others. Please note that uh, uh, participants may share content that may cause discomfort among some people. So please exercise your own discretion over your exposure and participation in this meeting. You may exit this meeting whenever you want. We will assume all our participants are adults over the legal age as identified um, in their countries. So we'll keep posting this message um, in the chat for our latecomers and for your discretion. And yeah. Uh, again, if you don't want your face to be shown in the recording, please feel free to turn off your cameras and um, change your name to be anonymous. Okay, so we can start recording. And, oops. Yeah, uh, so welcome to our live event today. I am uh, Michelle, your moderator for today. And uh, thank you guys again for joining us. And this discussion is for Coursera learners of the course of Art and Science of Relationship. And thank you for taking your time to be with us. Um, I'm very happy to see you all today. And also Jemima from our UFG team is here with us. And Jemima, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so I hope that you will enjoy the discussion and get a chance to get your question answered or share your thoughts. And yeah, Ted is also with us today, but let's begin with some warm up questions um, to um, see how everyone I'm, is. Doing. I'm sorry, yeah. um, Michelle. It, it, it's, it's something yeah. that we didn't plan, but like uh, seeing all the all the friends now on screen um, reminds me of one thing that might be of some interest. Um, yeah. So for people who feel comfortable that it is not uh, obligatory, uh, it would be helpful if you, uh, only when you feel comfortable, like uh, to tell us a thing or two about yourself and which country you're from, so that like other people will have a, um, an idea of like who are at the meeting, it would uh, help us. But it is totally optional. Like if you do not feel comfortable doing that, you don't have to do that. Yeah, does anyone want to share? Yeah. Okay, hi Kat. Remember me, Wendy Lau? Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joined you once before. Yep. I had a few questions about the course, which I'll ask you later, but one, I haven't finished it yet. Is that okay? Is there a time limit? Uh, well, yeah, like, don't worry. Like, I th I think we either will find time for your question or if you're willing no, to no, stay that's my behind. Question. That, yeah, that's, that's my question. Fine. And I just yeah. want to like start thanking people who are entering into the chat. That's exactly what I wanted. Like, so Wendy, you may want to do the same. Uh, yeah, um, so, okay, so I'm uh, 84. I think I told, well, I don't know if I know if anybody came last time when I was here. Uh, 84 mm -hmm. Chem Eng, uh, I'm a caregiver at home. And mm -hmm. um, so I haven't finished the course yet, but I will at some point, thank you. Okay, thank you, Wendy. So maybe you want to like do what others are doing, like the, enter some of your info in the chat so that we have like an idea. Oh, so okay. now we see we have like people from oh, from Toronto, West, sorry, I'm from Baku, Toronto. Uh, Burma or Myanmar, Malaysia, uh, Poland, India, from UK. 
I want to thank everyone. Uh, yeah, and Cindy, uh, you're from U of T. Thank you. I saw someone raise their hand. I think it's uh oh, someone lowered their hand. I didn't catch the name. Sorry, but yeah, if you want to speak up, please feel free to. So I think it's the Stamashia Bagni. Yeah, Stamashia. Hello, I'm from Greece. My name is Tamatia. I know it's a little bit uh, difficult. <laughs> and it was uh, very interesting. I attended uh, the whole course of your uh, um, uh, from the Coursera. And it was really helpful for me since I'm, you know, uh, starting my uh, career right now after I have finished uh, my bachelor's degree. Uh, I have a couple of questions, though. Uh, but I think that we're going to see them, you know, along the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you for joining us. So back to you, Michelle. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no problem. That's really exciting to see so many people from all around the world. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. Okay, so um, just to see how everyone is doing, let's do a little bit of warm up. So um, can everyone open their web browser and head to menti.com, that is M-E-N-T-I.com and enter the code on the screen. So we have like two little survey question for today and you can type in your answer in the uh, chat the text box on menti.com and we'll share uh, what answer we get. Hmm. There's a way you could have done it in Zoom, right? Oh, I have no idea. Like, um, yeah, other people seem to be able to do this in in Zoom. It's um, what do they call it? It's a survey, right? The yeah. survey, the survey pool. Yeah, I think so. Um, but that's I think a, that's a good Michelle idea. Let's do that next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank. Thanks for the suggestion. But I think Michelle wants to do a uh, word cloud kind of output. Mentimeter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mentimeter. Hmm. I put in the code. It said waiting. For, oh, so are we waiting now? It says waiting um, for presentation to start. Wait, you entered the code and uh, it should lead you to a um, box that will show the the page that showed you the question and you can answer your No, no, no I'm not question. getting that. Okay, well, like, let me try it again. Maybe I put in the wrong number. Let, let me try it again. I, I'm I'm getting a message saying waiting for presentation to start. Is anybody else getting that? Waiting for presentation to start? I have got the questions like how do you feel today? And I have got three answers to be said. And no. then I got a message, the presenter hasn't changed the slide yet. So my I had to go to the next question, but it's waiting for you to change it. Six, two, okay. Six. I see. Like uh I changed it right now. So oh, what was the number? Six two six nine zero eight seven. Yeah, that's correct. The number is six two six nine zero eight seven. Well, I still don't get the questions. I get message waiting for presentation to start. But it's okay, actually, this is just for like a warm up. So we just want to know how people are feeling. If you don't have the access, you can just share like verbally. How are you feeling today? Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll put it, I'll put it in chat. Yeah, yeah, you can also put it in the chat. Like, uh, yeah, this is like, we're not doing a scientific uh, survey. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so don't sharing, worry. sharing in the chat is fine as well. Okay. Yeah. For the first so question getting... I got, yeah. yeah. 
for mm-hmm. the first question i got i got the question in my display yeah. but yeah. Uh, i'm not able to go to the next one it says the presenter oh. hasn't changed the slides yeah. yet please yeah. wait but actually here it has been changed so i think it's taking time no yeah. the... some other people they use survey monkey and they they put the link the survey monkey link in the chat and then we just click on the chat and go to survey monkey that's another way to do it sorry the second question will yeah. be end of the session so we're just asking the first question first the second slide would be after the session okay that is good so we're getting some very exciting answers like excited happy someone's tired joyful blessed intrigued okay yeah um so let's just go back to our presentation. Okay, so oopsie. Yeah, okay, so all right. Um, seems like we're ready to begin. And um, soon after, we'll hear from Professor Tat on um, like what he wants to share about our events and also um, some changes after the course. And um, later on, we'll also have a Q&A session. So we want to hear from all the learners um, that wanted to share their experience or ask questions. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask the questions during our Q&A today. And Jemima and I will also monitor the chatbot all throughout today's session. So without further ado, uh, we'll welcome our course professor and the founder of SSLD System. Please welcome Tat. Thank you, Michelle. Um... Okay, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, we we have uh, done this kind of um, live event before, uh, and we, we have been actually very encouraged by this. Uh, as I am providing you with the update, you will see uh, the way uh, this course is moving uh, and how uh, SSLD, which is the system uh, driving uh, this program, uh, and we also want to give you some idea uh, of um, what is happening to the SSLD system. So, Michelle, can you uh, take us to the next uh, yeah. slide? All right. So, um, as you know, like you are taking this course on the Coursera platform, and the Coursera platform is now uh, the world's um, most uh, popular uh, online course provider. Uh, I think uh, they have hundreds of millions of uh, subscribers. Um, and since the 2017, we actually have like uh, produced another uh, mass open online course or called MOOC uh, on the Coursera platform. This, this second one that we launched uh, was uh, on dementia care, which is uh, titled uh, Knowledge and Skills of uh, Dementia Care. Um, that is like uh, uh, an exciting development for us. We are now actually in the process of planning uh, another Coursera course on uh, also using the SSLD model, uh, which is uh, live world design, which is like you will see that word in uh, um, second to last uh, bullet point. Um, so after we have launched this uh, two courses, uh, uh, this one in particular has been very popular. Uh, as you may know, we have now got over 200,000 learners enrolled in this course worldwide. Um, and we have uh, attracted a lot of interest, including people pirating this course and like uh, copying it like and putting on uh, different websites. We have... Uh, uh, the, the the more uh, uh, prudent players 
uh, like uh, China's top university, the uh, Tsinghua University, um, who have approached us uh, and wanted to uh, translate uh, our two MOOCs uh, for the Chinese audience, uh, and we have uh, already done so. So uh, both the uh, the one that you're now taking uh, and the other one on dementia care uh, have been uh, translated into Chinese and they're now available on Tsinghua University's um, on online learning platform, which is uh, titled Shetang X. Um, so the other thing that we are very encouraged by is that I got quite a few requests from people uh, asking for permission to use this course uh, as part of their uh, regular academic programs. Uh, and there are like universities in other places who have done that. I, I still remember one time I was invited by a un university in uh, India, I think it's called the Reva REVA uh, University. Uh, and uh, to uh, they have adopted this as a required course for their um, Department of Psychology academic programs. Uh, and I uh, conducted a webinar for them uh, as well. Um, so, uh, attention and interest in the in the in this particular course uh, continue to grow. Um, and last year in twenty twenty three, the University of Toronto's uh, uh, global alumni community wanted us to custom design a uh, slightly enriched or enhanced version for them. Uh, Jemima, uh, whom you see here today, uh, was the key uh, coordinator for production and uh, distribution of that course. Uh, and that was like a time limited offer uh, made by the University of Toronto that is like only uh, within like a couple of months, I believe, Jemima, correct me if I'm wrong. And we've got over 4,000 uh, alumni uh, enrolled and the completion rate is really impressive with over 3,000 um, uh, people who are enrolled in this course completing it. Um, so those are like the things that are happening with the uh, uh, Coursera platform and, and in the related um, uh, development. Uh, what we are also doing is that we have like a lot of SSLD applications. Many of you may or may not be aware SSLD actually has been applied to a wide range of human service contacts. Uh, including like children with uh, autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, I just mentioned dementia. Uh, we have been uh, utilized in uh, contexts where uh, parenting uh, is a key theme. Uh, we 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 have like LIVO design uh, is what we believe to be a, a better alternative to uh, traditional or conventional career planning uh, because like uh, you cannot just be planning your career without uh, due regard to the other aspects of your life. Uh, we also have like some uh, very impressive success with uh, internet gaming disorder. Uh, in uh, as a form of intervention. Um, SSLD actually has been like utilized in other areas as well, including like immigration settlement work uh, and areas such as wealth management. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor that now, uh, just that like we have multiple programs uh, developing. And because of that, we decided to create our own online course platform, uh, which is called Aspire, and it will be a multilingual uh, global um, platform. We now have like a couple of uh, productions uh, on the way. Some is already completed. We, for instance, uh, have a special program on uh, sleeping and insomnia or sleep related issues, uh, which is initially going to be offered in the Cantonese language, but we will have like subsequent versions. We also are planning uh, to address uh, social service and mental health needs in the uh, global Muslim communities uh, by creating a course on um, mental health 
for Muslim communities. We have people from Italy, uh, Sudan, and other countries uh, reaching out to us, wanting to uh, collaborate uh, to create uh, SSLD uh, content uh, for their respective countries. So we are actually quite excited with all these developments. Um, more recently, because we have been like uh, working in the area of intimacy and interpersonal relationships, um, Michelle, uh, who is hosting our uh, program today, uh, is actually part of my uh, newly forged uh, AI team. Uh, we actually started exploring the application of AI in psychology and uh, interpersonal relationships. Uh, psychology and mental health uh, since early 2023. Uh, and Michelle has been a, a strong uh, team member uh, exploring some very exciting applications within the uh, AI uh, domain. Recently, we're working with colleagues from other uh, divisions of the University of Toronto, including people in psychology, in computer science, in engineering, in medicine, uh, to work together uh, to address the challenge of social isolation and loneliness, which some of you may know um, has been identified by the uh, United States uh, Surgeon General uh, as a, a global health uh, risk. So, um, and because of our work in this area, we are invited to join the team and we are now working on exploring the development of uh, chatbots uh, to address social isolation and loneliness. Uh, and it has like, it is a multi-disciplinary uh, initiative. Uh, I just get, want to give you one example. One of our um, colleagues uh, at the Faculty of Medicine believes that uh, uh, social isolation and loneliness uh, may increase the risk of cardiovascular accidents. And he is like part of our team uh, exploring the implication of social isolation and loneliness. Uh, university administrators have also noticed that like uh, social isolation and loneliness, sometimes associated with social anxiety, uh, is presenting a challenge to higher education because many of our uh, undergraduate and graduate students are experiencing so, uh, social anxiety, social isolation and loneliness, and that has um, a very significant negative impact on their learning uh, and career development. So uh, as you can see, right, we, we like the, the course that you're taking actually lays the foundation uh, for some further work uh, that people were in education, in research, uh, and in uh, the wider professional practice area are interested in. Um, I already told you a little bit about like ongoing research and development with other applications, so I'm not going to repeat this. Um, and the course that you're taking, because like it was launched in 2017, we believe that parts of that program may need to be updated. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, like uh, internet dating, for instance, uh, has made a very significant advancement uh, in the last while. Uh, and the module that we produced back in 2016, because we launched it in 2017, the actual production was in 2016, uh, we believe needs to be updated. And we are in the process of like reviewing parts of that uh, for updating. Uh, one of the things that um, we also may want to be looking at is like the uh, global situation uh, related to LGBTQ uh, communities. Uh, we, uh, we we believe that like over the last while, uh, there has also been like significant uh, developments. Uh, to give you an example, I was in Taiwan uh, a couple of years ago uh, when uh, they um, uh, legislated uh, to allow for same-sex marriage. Uh, so, uh, and then we, we also see like a growing trend uh, of people meeting uh, their, uh, their partner online and uh, negotiating what we call long distance or commuter relationships. So they, we have like, quite a few things uh, that we need to be updating. Uh, back to the uh, U of T uh, uh, Global Alumni Program, one of the modules that we have uh, created specifically for them, which is new, uh, focuses on how our early 
experience in life and our attachment patterns with our parents uh, might affect uh, our subsequent development of interpersonal relationship and intimacy uh, in adult life. So we also have like, you know, um, new uh, topics that uh, people are interested in. And one of the reasons why we are holding this uh, live event is one for us to learn from you, our learners, uh, what your experience uh, has been, what do you think uh, or th uh, things that will enrich this learning program. And you may even uh, help us uh, understand uh, why uh, um, we should be moving in particular uh, directions and addressing uh, specific learning needs that we haven't been uh, uh, doing in the past. So that is the, that is the one reason. The other thing is like many people expressed interest through their uh, communication with us that one, they want to learn more. Two, there are people who also are interested in connecting with the other learners. So we are now creating this platform uh, to make that possible. And we also have people uh, coming to us saying that they want to join our team uh, as learners, as volunteers, or as like partners in research and development. Uh, so we, are, we want to open up these opportunities and maybe start building a small network or community of interested individuals uh, so that we can uh, move forward. Um, SSLD is actually like, um, quite active in different parts of the world. And we are very excited to see all of you here today. So that is my update. So I, I probably should stop here and, and let um, Michelle uh, take us on to the next uh, part of our agenda. Yeah, that's amazing, Ted. Um, so for people who want to like learn more about SSLD or become an SSLD practitioner, uh, we'll have our email in the chat or uh, we'll send an email to you guys at the end of the session. And if people are interested, please feel free to email us. And um, our next part of the live event will be our Q&A session. But before that, um, I think it will be a good idea to take like a five minutes break because we don't want to keep you guys here for too long. And um, please feel free to like, go grab a drink, uh, go grab a bite or something, and we'll come back like five minutes later. I will also say that like, it is also uh, possible if you want to uh, take uh, some time during your five minute break to uh, type in like questions that you want to see answered, the topics you want to see explored. Uh, you can type them into the chat. We may not be able to address every one of them, but like uh, Michelle and Jemima will be keeping an eye on uh, what you enter into the chat. Yeah, okay. So I'll see you guys five minutes later. Cool. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, bye. Yeah, thank you. verbally uh, and then maybe we can take turns we can uh, do some of that and uh, some people may prefer to be like uh, um, raising the, the questions verbally why don't we start with that and then like we can also switch to some of the questions that are already in the chat okay sure yeah mine are real quick okay well, I was enrolled in the dimension uh, no in the SSLD in the fall of 2023. I haven't finished it yet. Is there a time limit? There is? Yes. Uh, Jemima, you can, like, I, th I think we were told by the alumni office that they have, like, closed the course already, right? Yeah, for the alumni I course. I clicked it the other day, and it still seemed to be working. Uh, when the, If you have enrolled, I think so. But, like, if you uh, – I don't think they're admitting new registrants no, at this No, point. I enrolled. I just haven't finished oh, it yet. Then that's fine. Then I think you should be able to do that. <laughs> okay. Also, last time you gave me the dementia course link, but my computer crashed, so I lost it. 
Could, That's can fine. Like uh, Jemima can provide it here. I already right, put thanks. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Th that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Tusha has a sign up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ted, for giving the wonderful opportunity for organizing this webinar. And uh, I am equally privileged because I got a chance in the previous in 2021 as well uh, to participate in the webinar of yours. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. My question is that, uh, like, uh, because of the current global scenario, because of the advent of the AI, and especially of the chat GPT causing many young people losing their jobs. So uh, I want to ask, what are the social implications of that? And what steps one should take to oneself socially stable? Thank you. Wow, that's that's a tall order. Um, Tusha, I think the honest answer is that I don't have the full answer. As you know, many people have who know uh, AI way better than I do have already weighed in on the issue, including Jeffrey Hinton, which is like a U of T professor, as you know, who is sometimes referred to as the, the father of AI. Uh, he has also weighed in. Uh, people in political science, like people like Ian Bremer, uh, have have like uh, spoken on the subject. So there, like uh, to to like I I'm going to give you like an oversimplified uh, framework, right? Some people were very excited about the potential of AI. Um, Michelle here, <laughs> who is like uh, uh, hosting today's uh, event, as I told you, uh, is very very enthusiastic about the potential application of AI. But people also have legitimate reasons to be concerned, uh, in, including like uh, people. Uh, this is like I'm quoting uh, Ian Bremer, whom you, you might know uh, is the, uh, has famously raised like the 10 major risks for year 2024. And one of them uh, uh, was AI. Uh, he has like quite a few points about like the potential and the potential benefits and the potential threats associated with AI uh, pertaining to like um our vulnerability. And uh, uh, to make things very, very simple, one of the points that he made was that because the technologies are advancing so fast, uh, the regulators cannot catch up. And that opens up windows for uh, both good players and bad players, right? So, uh, and some of the bad players are state-sponsored players. Uh, so uh, we, we do not know how, where it will take us, uh, but there is obviously uh, risk involved. Let me give you an example. We now have a lot of like online um, uh, frauds, uh, that, are, that are targeting uh, vulnerable people in the field of uh, intimacy and erotic relationship, which we are interested in, as you know, uh, even the yeah. FBI have a special web page for that now. Like th these are referred to as like romantic frauds. And sometimes this can be like uh, operated by AI, uh, which will like look for your vulnerability uh, and get you on to... Um, making decisions and taking actions uh, that, are, that, are, that are like uh, actively detrimental to your wellness and your interests. So we have already heard about those cases and I've been consulted on some of those cases. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I don't think I can give you a full answer to share, uh, but if you're interested, like uh, stay tuned, uh, Michelle and I, and we actually have other members on the team uh, and U of T actually, as I, I mentioned, the University of Toronto now has like a, a multidisciplinary team uh, working on this topic, uh, but you can stay tuned or if you want to uh, um, be uh, informed or like get in touch with us, we hopefully will be able to make some uh, public um, uh, statements to like YouTube or other channels uh, to keep people updated uh, regarding our current development and and our own takes uh, on on AI. There are like so many things. I want just want to share another story that you can just Google. Uh, this course is like uh, offered on the Coursera platform, right? One of the co-founders uh, of Coursera, Andrew Ng, uh, I'm typing his name in the um, um, chat so that you can look up the guy. Uh, is working together with uh, Tinder dating application uh, using AI and hopefully uh, help to address some of the issues that we are, we are trying to address 
uh, in our course. So like uh, we have all sorts of people trying to do uh, different things, but like, I, I don't think I can give you like a, a good answer, but like maybe I should stop here. And if you're interested, we can stay in touch and, and continue this uh, discussion. Thank you, thank you. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you. But I, I think there are some interesting questions from the chat. Okay. Um, from CK, there's yep. from SSLD perspective, how mm -hmm. might you encourage relationship building with someone who has been identified as narcissist? This can be particularly tricky when the person is in a position of authority, such as parent or your superior. Yeah, like um, I, I think I will uh, sort of like zoom out a little bit from this question. Uh, we know that there are all sorts of people with personality uh, problems, right? So uh, narcissistic personality is one of them, but this is not actually the most dangerous. We have like the sociopathic personality, which is like way more dangerous. And then we have like the borderline personality disorder, which is like even more difficult to deal with. So... One of one of the things that uh, we need to understand uh, is that when people are uh, suffering from a personality disorder, very often the N3C assessment that we have learned from SSLD may or may not apply. It's not that because the theory is not valid, it's that like these people very often has like what we call very distorted organization of personal aims, meaning that they do not always pursue what even what is even in their own best interest. So um, they may be actively seeking uh, outcomes or uh, experience uh, that do not really address their needs. And then and, and they repeat a uh, maladaptive pattern, which is cyclical, uh, which is harmful to themselves as, as well as others. So people who are narcissists, who have a narcissistic personality disorder, for instance, uh, very often uh, suffers from uh, a sense of loneliness, isolation, not feeling being understood and loved. So they have their own uh, difficulties as well. Uh, and they need to like learn new modes of like uh, relating to people. They even have to uh, go through some dramatic reconstruction of their cognitive schema, uh, which can uh, only be achieved uh, through systematic uh, therapeutic intervention. Uh, but if you're on the receiving end, like you have like someone who has like a personality disorder, uh, like I, I would say if you have someone who, ha who has like a narcissistic uh, personality disorder, that actually is not the most uh, uh, challenging. Well, all you need to do is basically maintain your uh, boundary uh, and do your own emotional regulation so that you do not get like uh, negatively impacted by this person's like uh, uh, st uh, uh, behavior and this person's um, uh, words. So, uh, and the other thing, of course, is like if you know that this person has a personality disorder, uh, then like being genuine, being empathic uh, may or may not help. And you may need to just like learn the appropriate strategies and skills uh, to deal with um, uh, that in a more instrumental manner. So in our course, you know that we have a section on dealing with instrumental relationships, right? And one of the, one of the key principles is not to take it personal, but understand clearly what your objective is in that encounter. Uh, and sometimes when you know that uh, developing a genuine interpersonal relationship is not realistic, uh, then maybe we'll have to shift to that mode. So you're in a more uh, instrumental uh, mode, which in which you will be like mainly trying to achieve your own objectives uh, without getting uh, too emotionally involved. And I think that might be uh, a um, temporary position to take. Uh, it will not solve the problem. It will not change the other person's uh, uh, personality. And, and I think it is a dangerous idea uh, or at least risky idea for you to want to change someone with a personality disorder through a, uh, social interaction. It, 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 uh, the, the chance of that working out is very 
uh, slim. So I think a more um, pragmatic uh, response will be to protect your own interests uh, so that your needs are being met uh, within that context, especially when this person uh, has um, more power, right? Uh, the other thing is, of course, is like to learn to, to leverage whatever power you have, uh, especially the power that are externally um, established. Uh, like say, for example, if you're working in a unionized uh, environment, like uh, you, you may leverage uh, whatever protection uh, that your union may offer you. If you have like a, a, a you're working in a bigger corporation with uh, well-established like child policies, you may also want to learn to use that uh, to your advantage and protect your own interests. Uh, there are also obvious like uh, interpersonal skills that we can uh, share with you, but like maybe not here, right? In terms of uh, conflict resolution, the escalation um, and like uh, trying to uh, get at uh, uh, workable concessions and compromises. Uh, and one of the components in the course that would be helpful in situations like this is the uh, idea of responsive assertiveness. Uh, for people who have taken that module, you will uh, know what I'm talking about. Uh, so yeah, I think that's my answer for now. I know we, like uh, uh, you probably need like a, a more uh, specific and operationalized answer, CK, uh, but that will have to uh, we'll have to find another opportunity to get into details. Okay, okay. amazing. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jamal. No, no, um, you can. I was just like, there are a few interesting like questions on the chat. Yeah. Sure. How do you want to move forward? Yeah. Okay. So like, um, Stamisha asked about like um, trauma. Um, so we actually have an SSLD intervention for trauma. Uh, I am not sure if I can quickly, like find it quickly enough. If I can, I will show you. Okay, give me a sec. Uh, I may be able to do that. Um, manual hell. Because trauma is like very often um, uh, raised. Um, okay. So I'm going to share screen with you now um, to, okay, share screen. So uh, uh, Michelle, you have to stop your share uh, so that I can. Oh, yes. Okay, okay don't worry. Yes. All right. So, um, all right. Can people see this uh, document? All right. So like yeah. this is like, um, so we can see there is actually a, a long document uh, about uh, SSLD and trauma following the 60 analysis. Like, so we have specific, uh, as you can see here, we have like specific interventions uh, based on the six domains that you should be familiar with at this point, like environment, motivation, cognition, uh, emotion, body, and behavior. So um, we have, and then we also have like a uh, holistic and transcendental perspective on trauma as well. Um, we, we obviously do not have time uh, to uh, give you another long lecture on how to uh, work with trauma, but like the program is uh, in existence. We have actually been applying this uh, to quite a few contexts. Let me give you some examples. Uh, we have uh, refugees coming to Canada uh, from war-torn areas. Like one of the projects that I was involved in was like working with like refugees from Syria uh, to Canada. And many of these people have experienced extreme trauma. More recently, as you know, we have people from Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Palestine uh, who have uh, experienced, uh, again, like trauma related to armed conflict. Uh, another project that I've been like uh, involved in over the last while uh, is with the Muslim communities in Canada. And some of them experience uh, trauma uh, associated with Islamophobia, uh, and how they were being uh, attacked 
uh, or uh, excluded socially because uh, of who they are and because of their uh, religion and their culture. So we have uh, like experience. We have like worked with a wide range of uh, traumas. But of course, like I think uh, Stamesha, what you're referring to would be like specifically with, with uh, related to trauma that you experience in an intimate relationship, uh, which we have also worked with. Actually, uh, a couple of learners from this course uh, have reached out to me talking about uh, the abusive relationship that they were in. And I believe uh, we may at some point create a specialized module uh, to help people um, manage and and uh, exit from abusive relationships. We have, um, I'm not sure it is in the course, we have uh, in, our, in, our, in the textbook, we actually have uh, a case of an immigrant woman uh, we, we gave her a, a, a fake name, uh, Suma, uh, who actually uh, worked through uh, building her own self-advocacy and then like uh, leaving an abusive relationship. So we have like some uh, direct practice experience with this and I'm happy uh, to come up with a more, a sort of like more elaborated uh, module uh, on the topic uh, if there is sufficient interest. And this is part of the reason why we're holding this uh, live events because we want to hear from people uh, what, are, what are the issues they uh, want to learn more about and hopefully we'll be able to respond to some of them. Okay, cool. Amazing. So um, we have a lot of uh, questions. Actually, we might not be able to get through all the questions, but um, let's see. From Helen, uh, how can someone utilize SSLD to navigate a changing or multi-dimensional relationship? For example, I own a business with my mother and stepdad. Our family relationship is now intertwined with professional and financial concern because the business is the mean for uh, their secure retirement. Okay. Uh, thank you, Helen. I, I don't know if I, uh, you know, like uh, people who have attended my previous um, online events, I may have referred to this experience, I may or may not. Like uh, I, I have been like working with uh, corporations um, in uh, different parts of the world, including uh, some of the biggest uh, uh, corporations in the in the Fortune 500 list, uh, and one time I was uh, approached by a huge family business uh, in in Asia, uh, and it is like very similar to what you have here, Helen. Uh, is, we have a family running a huge business, um, and then like uh, they got into all sorts of conflicts and. Uh, in, the most fundamental being like value conflicts when then the other one, uh, the other set uh, of conflicts is actually related to uh, a lot, the, the long history of tension and ambivalence, rivalry and, and all that. And obviously because we have like material interests at stake, you know, uh, that then uh, it, it becomes uh, even uh, more difficult. Um, to deal with all these issues together. So I, I don't think I can give you like a uh, simple um, solution, but like there are a few principles. One that is very important in situations like this is a clarification of rules and clarification of rules. So the, the, it is really important uh, that we know like who, it, like uh, each other's role and each other's um, uh, uh rights uh and then we also have the rules so you you're talking about the three hours so right? the rules the rights uh and the rules but the rules like some some people say well we're like what about responsibility that's another hour like if the rules are clear then like people's responsibility will be clearly defined uh so that is like uh i, I would say just like a preliminary 
uh, answer to your question. Uh, some of the things, as you know, like when you're dealing with a family, uh, we cannot assume everyone to be rational all the time. A lot of times people will be motivated uh, by like emotional issues. So they may even make decisions that are like not in their own best interest, even like financially. Uh, some people, uh, if you have seen like couples going through divorce, like uh, like who are willing to basically like uh, consume all the financial resources in legal battles instead of settling, uh, then you understand how irrational people can be uh, when their intense emotion was uh, involved. So I think that one of the things is to help them understand their own emotional response uh, and tr help them appreciate how their emotions are helping or not helping themselves and the other members in the family or in the corporation. So those are some of the, okay, like, the lessons I, I extracted from my uh, previous uh, consultation experience. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, there are also, Katrina has a question regarding with AI. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, you mentioned chatbot research with SSLD as basis. What mm -hmm. is your hunch on replacing, if that is what you're proposing, a human-to-human -human interface with one mm -hmm. non-human in uh, a therapeutic relationship? What are the REBs saying about this type of research? Okay, so like, I think Michelle, you can answer some part of this question. You have been going through this with me like uh, quite a few times when we go to meetings. Uh, but like, let me very quickly respond to this. Like, um, first of all, we have to understand uh, a key dimension in the use of AI. And this is like both a strength and a threat is this ability to respond to individualized needs. So this is like a very important thing to recognize, right? Starting with the cookies in your in your like search engine, uh, like AI gets to know about individual dif differences. So why am I starting with this point? Because like I would tell you, like some people would, for instance, prefer um, working with AI and some people would prefer working with uh, like uh, what they believe to be a human uh, character. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with words here because, as you know, increasingly you will have AI that will be indistinguishable from an actual human character, right? So uh, one easy example that I can give you is customer service. Right. Some people do not want to like waste time like talking to someone on the phone. I can just like chat uh, and then I can text in my question, get my answers, get my issues resolved, and they're very happy. Uh, some other people with exactly the same issue uh, would want to be talking to a hu real human being. Right. Uh, and AI very, very soon will be able to give you both experience, right? uh, depending on your preferred mode of communication. Uh, maybe I can give you an, an example, uh, it, like in uh, psychotherapy. If you go online now, you will already see people saying that, or claiming that AI is better than their therapist. You have, like, you, like there's tons of that on online now, right? Uh, like testimonials, like uh, personal reports. But then there are obviously also people who have tried AI and 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 felt that it uh, it is it, get, it is not going to be able to replace the in person uh, therapy that they were receiving. So what does it tell us? It actually tells us about the difference and three C of the surface user. So remember what you learn in this course. Like people were different, so they have different needs. They have like they're under different circumstances. They have different characteristics, which includes values and preference, uh, and learning history and uh, and all that and personal history. Uh, and they also have different capacities. Like some people cannot use AI because they do not know how to use it, right? Uh, so, but some people do not have the capacity to enter into an interpersonal relationship, a face-to-face -face relationship because they have social anxiety, right? Or severe social phobia. So 
So the N3C of the user would determine what is the best treatment or what the best uh, service uh, for them. So that is like what we are working on. Uh, I just want to like uh, take this opportunity to, to share an experience that Michelle is aware of, like Jemima has also heard this story. Uh, I uh, was given the opportunity to uh, speak to our doctoral students uh, about a month ago. And uh, honestly, uh, I was pretty disappointed uh, by their response because I emphasized to them how important AI is and how important it is for any helping profession uh, to stay on top and at least understand what is happening, right? But I think uh, some of the students and some of my younger colleagues were feeling so insecure that they cannot even uh, get my message. They thought that I was there to sell them uh, AI. And, and as, as you see, when I was referring to uh, Tusha's uh, question earlier, I'm not like a uh, uh, um, uncritical uh, advocate for AI. I'm aware of like many of the threats uh, and the potential risk, right? But uh, when you see people who feel intimidated by new technology and their first response is to try to convince themselves that this is not a good thing and I better uh, uh, would have like nothing to do with it, that to me is not the best attitude. Right, you're not you're not working, uh, even uh, in your own best interest, and especially when you're helping professional, I think you owe it to yourself and to your service clients that you stay on top of the like the leading edge of knowledge, uh, be aware of its like uh, major implications, and to utilize it in such a way that it will address the needs. Uh, of your service clients. So Michelle and I, for instance, are now working on a, an initiative uh, which will be using AI to reach out to university undergraduates who have like severe social anxiety and maybe to the extent of having social phobia. And these people have difficulty meeting someone in person and talking to them. Um, I have once conducted an SSLD-based social phobia treatment group and these are people with severe social phobia to the extent that even when they come to an in-person meeting, it would be too challenging for them to just tell you their names. And what we did is to get them write down their names and pass it to the person sitting next to them, like around the circle, and they read out the name of the other person. So... Uh, that is like how uh, severe it can be. So like if you're working with individuals like this, they probably would prefer an AI chatbot uh, to like uh, seeing someone in person, right? But then obviously like you have other people who who would prefer to be like meeting someone in person. So I don't think we have an easy answer. Like there is like a, like, there is never like a one size fits all answer to this. We need to pay attention again, back to SSLD principles, the needs, the circumstances, the characteristics and the capacity of the service user. Michelle, do you want to have uh, something to add? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think AI is definitely a very intriguing field of study and uh, combining AI with social work. Like, it's something that we cannot ignore for our future. So that's just my take because it's there. And if we ignore it, then uh, we don't know anything about it and we don't know how to address the future potential or risk. So that's just what I think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and also think, we have, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I, I want to quickly address like an, an issue, which is like sort of more academic, but I think Katrina also were asking about like uh, um, research ethics bots. Uh, so as I um, referred to um, Ian uh, Bremer's comment earlier, like the regulatory bodies would have the problem catching up with the technology. So the REBs would do whatever they can to the best of their knowledge at this point. But like, I wouldn't be surprised that like the technology is moving so fast, right? That uh, they will have difficulty catching up. Yeah. Um, Sorry, just- I Okay, so we, yeah. The key then- Yeah, Katrina. That you've, 
you're giving people the opportunity to self-select, right? So you're mm -hmm. their autonomy and telling yep. them what risks are. And that that would satisfy the REV, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what I hear is like that maybe is better if the person doesn't know. Like you can fool them using using AI if they can't tell it's a real person, it might work for them. Right. But but they just they just don't like the idea of talking to a robot. So mm -hmm. But that would that be ethical to not tell them? Well, like uh, that is a classic uh, uh, research ethics question. Uh, the use of deception, like which psychologists have been doing for like uh, many decades. Um, I think rules uh, in that regard are pretty well established. Uh, but back to Katrina's uh, earlier comment about um, uh, like giving them the autonomy and choice, uh, you may also be aware that like some uh, REBs tend to be overly protective uh, of the uh, research participants. Uh, and and it is a it is a constant um, tension because we believe in like people's autonomy and uh, the uh, the ability to make informed risk is actually a citizen's right. So uh, but then like you know you also have like members sitting on our EBs who tend to be like protective and and do not want to allow this to happen and then you see there is a huge difference uh, across countries in a in a uh, more like uh, the tigers uh, culture like uh, the USA uh, you have people being more worried about potential lawsuits uh, i just want to give you an a, an interesting example in dementia care the united kingdom department of health has published a uh, the policy document, which in my opinion uh, is brilliant, uh, uh, very positive and very constructive. They argue that risk taking is a citizen right. And life is actually not worth living if you are not allowed to take risk. When you translate that principle to dementia care, then you see the challenge. So what you see is that like uh, NGOs in the UK were able to allow more risk uh, in the people they work with than say in North America, because here people will be like thinking more about like uh, what will happen in the courtroom, <laughs> like in, uh, in, a, in a civil uh, lawsuit. So so you can so I just want to point out there's like also cultural difference even in the Western world, right? Uh, regarding risk and like how likely uh, we will end up seeing each other in court. Um, so, but sometimes it can like this like overemphasis right on legal process uh, can backfire and limit. Uh, the range of options that we can make available to people. Like, so in this particular case, I would use like risk taking by people diagnosed with dementia, right? It's, so remember if like someone claims to be protecting you and make all the decisions for you, uh, is not necessarily ethical in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ted. Uh, let's address a earlier question. So mm -hmm. from the Windborn, uh, could you discuss some theories regarding relationship compatibility? Does the program cover this? Um, relationship compatibility. I think we did. Yeah, I think we. I think we. We are helping people to understand how their uh, respective N three C can be like understood and negotiated in any intimate relationship. I think that is the basis uh, for understanding compatibility. Okay. Um, yeah, we have more question actually. Mm -hmm. I'm just scrolling through because there are a lot. Thank you guys so much for participating. It's a very mm -hmm. engaging session. Mm-hmm. Okay, so from uh, Jana Kiran, uh, I don't think if it's it is a related question. How has the experience of surviving COVID nineteen, particularly spending time in the ICU, affected relationships? Given the potential for PTSD among survivors, 
how can an individual navigate these challenges and in their interaction with family and friends, especially considering the realization that support during critical moments may not always be guaranteed and feeling of abandonment, even years later? Oh, um, thank you for the question. I think this is like uh, something that like uh, people are still researching on. I don't think I have the conclusion yet, but like there are quite a few uh, important themes that you have already highlighted. First of all, is like um, being in the ICU and like in isolation, and sometimes there is like uh, very important uncertainties about your own health, and in some extreme cases, especially during the earlier phase of COVID, um, you 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 will have like serious doubts about your uh, possible survival. Uh, so that is like a a, a very a challenging situation for anyone to be like I mean I mean here I'm not I do not know even I'm going to survive or not and I'm totally cut off uh, from my family members and I cannot see them and they're not allowed to visit like for their protection or for mine um, so that can be a very challenging uh, traumatic experience so the the sense of abandonment isolation Helplessness actually is like another major emotion that we need to deal with. Um, uh, so that is like something uh, I've already shown you, like uh, how SSLD deals with uh, trauma. We have like, we actually work with all the six domains to help people uh, understand the tra traumatic experience better uh, and to help them view uh, strategies in all the six domains, right, to make them uh, more competent and um, self-sufficient uh, in dealing with that. So it, it would include cognitive reconstruction, emotional regulation, uh, reviewing the needs and how well they have been met, paying attention to signs of the body that can like it is like a wide range of somatic symptoms. It can be like something like a headache, it can be like insomnia, it can be ulcer, it can be like a, a disturbed menstrual cycle, uh, it can be like vague pain. Uh, so we can like, uh, but we we need to, uh, and, some, and in some people, it can actually uh, turn out in some kind of dermatological challenges like eczema. Uh, so it, we, we have like, all, we have to pay attention to how the body is responding and understanding that the body is probably processing uh, emotions or uh, emotional experiences that we are not dealing with. Uh, and obviously we will have to learn uh, specific behavior. We are already in a way lucky in that we now have internet, we have social media. Um, so uh, I have something very personal that I do not mind sharing with you. Um, my father passed away last June uh, and the last month, uh, he was in ICU, right? So we were we were there. That was post COVID, uh, but we are very thankful to the technology that we have. Like one of his uh, grand uh, children, my niece, uh, is living in Asia, uh, and we, like throughout the period, we were able to get her family involved uh, and 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 engaged um, with my father till the very last moment. Uh, through social media uh, and uh, so and we will have to find ways right to help him uh, communicate sometimes it's like uh, it's difficult one of the things that uh, we did in the last days of his life is to help him use his finger to write on my ipad uh, to indicate uh, his wish uh, and and preferences because uh, he had like severe COPD uh, and was not able to talk and he has to have his like oxygen mask on all the time. Uh, so uh, when we when we deal with situations like this, we have to um, sometimes be creative, improvise. But the key thing here is to communicate in whatever means we can to the person who is in ICU that he does, he, he or she is not forgotten uh, by the world and we still care. That's great, thank you, Professor. Um, so there are some comments uh, from CK from an academic university point of view. 
I will not be surprised if Professor Weaver back to more immediate in-class pen and paper assignment as a means to curb use of AI for completion of work. What do you think of that? Well, like you already know what I think about. <laughs> so Michelle maybe can tell them like how I how I like some of the some of the uh, naughty things that I did. Like maybe you can tell tell them the experience of what I did with you, uh, and that will tell people oh. where to stand with uh, with regard to AI. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, it was a very interesting experiment. So I'm an undergrad student, and then Ted gave me a master of social work. Uh, student assignment and I've not taken any course on that uh, topic so I tried to finish this whole assignment with the help of AI and it was quite successful so yeah this is a very interesting experiment to do mm -hmm. and I want to uh, share this other experience um, uh, with you um, CK uh, and Last year, that is like early 2023, when academia just woke up uh, to the challenge of AI, one of my colleagues uh, sent me an assignment uh, written by AI for our master's classes, and he was very concerned. And I worked with my team and asked um, AI to review that paper critically. And then we go through a few rounds, right? Uh, of iteration using AI. And the, the conclusion is very simple. Uh, if we allow students to use AI freely, I can still tell the strongest students from the weakest students. Uh, and I actually posted the uh, results of this experiment online and my LinkedIn account. And we have like, I, I think like hundreds of th or thousands of impressions. Um, I actually asked uh, the AI tool that we're using, what does it think of people's criticism? Uh, and uh, I have I had a very interesting conversation um, with the AI. And one of the uh, one of the things that like actually surprised me was like I said like, well, you know, if I ask students to hand in not just the final paper but the actual conversation with AI, right? that would allow me to make a better assessment uh, of how effective they are in using AI to help them create uh, this piece of academic work. Uh, and guess what? The AI reminded me of potential uh, ethical issues. <laughs> Is that like, you know, you have, you, you have, uh, you have to uh, uh, be careful that you're not infringing into the privacy of your student. Uh, because we do not like you know the conversation can entail uh, other stuff like that can be uh, personal and 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 should be protected uh, legally. So, uh, so it is not a, a simple thing. That this is why I think the the best way to deal with AI is to be engaged with it with an open mind, uh, with honesty, uh, and bring in. The best of our ethical principles, uh, and uh, try to uh, make sure that we w always work to the best interests uh, of ourselves and the students that we are teaching. And one of the things that I, I just yeah. want I have I've been making this argument to my uh, colleagues at the University of Toronto. I said like you are not helping your students by. Uh, forbidding them to use AI because when they graduate and they go into the workplace, AI will be everywhere. So learning how to use it ethically and constructively, uh, in my opinion, is the is the best uh, strategy for academics. Okay, uh, so there's, I think we have time for about one to two more questions. Um, there's a question from Damatia. Um, what do you think of domestic violence on SSLD? How can we provide therapy using SSLD? Okay, so like uh, I I I think I'm giving you the impression that SSLD. Uh, uh, can solve every problem and like we have an application for every uh, issue. Uh, I just want to state very clearly, no, it is not the case, right? Like we do not have an answer for everything. But 
we do have something for domestic violence. Uh, <clears throat> let me show you that. Um, <clears throat> I actually have been like doing a fair bit uh, of work. Uh, so let me share screen with you now again. Okay. So uh, all right, share. So you see, this is like the uh, folder and um, we have uh, DV and IPV, which stands for domestic violence and in, uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, and you see, we have this in multiple languages. Um, and let me just like quickly show you one of the, um, so we, you can see that we have been doing this like, uh, from the 90s to more recently, this is like sort of like the, yeah. So I'll, I'll just like uh, show you very quickly. So some of these concepts you've already learned in the course, but like um, it is just like applied differently. Like I want to show you this two slides in particular. Do you find like, do you see what is most striking about this? You have people behaving in like extreme opposite ways. Like one is an abuser, the other is like uh, the, the receiver of abuse but their needs can be very similar. So again, we have the six domain uh, formulation here for dealing with, uh, and we know the like change process. We have actually worked with quite a few cases uh, of uh, domestic violence and intimate partner violence. So you see life world design is actually a component. Right? All right, so yeah, like that is a, a, a brief answer to your question. So we actually do have a program uh, for people who are interested, uh, we are happy to, like, I just do not have enough time, you know, like if I have time, I will be cre like creating like 20 different online courses. Uh, but hopefully, uh, like Michelle and Jemima are now helping me together with like our, our fantastic production teams here at the University of Toronto. We're actually in the process of producing uh, online modules for some of these issues that people have indicated interest in. And hopefully we'll be either a, uh, able to post them on YouTube as a start. And maybe we can also be creating like smaller like mini series or like uh, uh, courses. Producing a full-fledged uh, course like the one that you're now taking actually takes us almost an entire year uh, of uh, hard work. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we, I, we do not promise we'll be able to do like one for every topic, but I think uh, put creating a uh, helpful module uh, to be put on YouTube is probably doable within the next while. And this is why we need your yeah. input uh, to to guide us, like uh, towards like what we should be doing. Yeah, thank you, Kat. That's uh, yeah. Are you doing anything for homecoming, Kat? On um, this May, you got your oh, department homecoming. Well, U of T homecoming. No, no, no. I'm not. No. Okay. Just wondering. Uh, okay. for, because for I will, I I will be out in Singapore teaching a summer course. Oh. Okay. Okay, uh, so thank you, Todd, for answering those questions, and thank you, everyone, who raised the question and your thoughts. Let's wrap up the session. We have, like, five minutes left. So um, we are, so 
our next plan for our production and uh, the U of T team is that we're going to build up a YouTube channel on related topics such as psychotherapy. And uh, we're going to have content in three different languages, which is English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. So um, right now we have some of the content from the other platform of TAT on our YouTube channel right now. So um, if you guys are interested, please follow our YouTube channel. It's uh, Kat Tazang. And we'll be posting very shortly, um, starting from probably May. Yeah, and also um, we would like to know your um, opinion on uh, the live session and also how to improve our next course because we're also developing an online course on uh, Ted's own platform called Spire. And here's a QR code, as you can see on the screen. So it would be nice if you can scan the QR code and um, let us know your thoughts or fill in the form um, with this link here, like down below. And yeah, that's pretty much it for our session today. Oh, and also uh, I've seen some comment that uh, people are interested in becoming SSLD practitioners and uh, volunteering opportunities. So uh, for people who are interested in that, please contact us on um, this email address, info at ktzang.com, and our team will reply to the email after the session. Yeah, so Ted, do you have anything else you want to say? Yeah, I, I just want to tell people that like we now have an uh, 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 increasing number of people who are interested in becoming a uh, uh, certified uh, SSLD practitioner. Uh, previously, we haven't been promoting this uh, too much because uh, our training and uh, supervision uh, capacity were limited. Uh, but now, like uh, with like um, more experience, like using online uh, platforms and AI, uh, we we are willing to uh, take a little bit of risk uh, by uh, and engage people uh, remotely who want to uh, be uh, qualified as an SSLD practitioner. So for people who are interested, uh, it would be uh, we would welcome. Um, you to uh, try to join our um, network of SSLD practitioners. The other thing that I actually uh, am hoping for is that there are people who are more than interested, who have like a, a more ambitious plan uh, of not just wanting to become a practitioner, but want to be a trainer because we actually need more trainers um, and um program designers and the SSLD model. So like if any one of you who are already in a teaching, training uh, or consultant kind of position uh, in any field of human service uh, and you uh, are interested in becoming an SSLD trainer, uh, we would also want to be talking to you, especially in parts of the world where we do not have established um, networks uh, that would actually be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. And also, uh, we will have another live session about like 10 hours from now, which is like 8.30 p.m. EDT. So if you have more questions, you're welcome to join us. And uh, sorry for if we missed any questions because because of the time limits. So yeah, that's it, I think. Thank you yeah, guys I just, so much I, for I, I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, hopefully like we'll be in touch with some of you uh, after this. And uh, if you're interested uh, uh, in doing this again, we have another session as like Michelle has explained. And uh, I'm also hoping that uh, some of you who are interested in like joining our team as volunteers or like you want to become uh, practitioners or trainers, uh, please do get in touch with us. Thank you so much, chat. Okay. Nice, nice to see you. Most welcome. Okay, bye. Okay. Okay, thank you guys so much. Have a nice day.